Today it's me, Suchakra, and this is Albin. And uh, we are going to present uh, TraceLeft. It's a configuration-driven uh, eBPF tracing framework that was done uh, um, like with uh, ShiftLeft as well as Kinvolk. So I'm from ShiftLeft, and this is uh, Albin from Kinvolk. And we did this. Uh, oh, we did this together in conjunction. And um, we'll see what all this is about. Uh, so. I'm Suchakra. I'm uh, a staff scientist at ShiftLev. This is some information about me. You can follow me at Textology if you want. Um, I did my PhD from Dorsal Polytechnic. I love tracing and I love performance analysis. And hello, I'm Alban. Um, I just say I love uh, Kubernetes, low-level Linux development. I'm a CTO at Kinfolk. Um, um, I will uh, say just a couple of words about uh, Kinfolk. Uh, so I guess since you are at All System Go, maybe almost of all of you uh, know Kinfolk, but we are just a um, software development team on, uh, on Linux, on Kubernetes, and um, we love uh, this kind of thing. Um, and something about ShiftLift, we are a continuous security uh, for cloud native application company. We try to provide uh, static analysis and carry it forward all towards uh, uh, runtime. So we basically kind of protect your applications. So uh, what's the agenda for today? So we are going to talk about TraceLeft, some background about it, uh, some background about tracing, actually, just to give you information of what we are dealing with here. Uh, architecture of TraceLeft. Um, there is trace configuration, because this is configuration driven, so you can actually do configuration. Um, how the configurations are presented, how the events are taken out from the configuration. And because it's based on BPF, some background about, about what eBPF is. We already have Alexi somewhere here, so I'm already scared about this. And then uh, use cases uh, where we are using it. And then most importantly, about some challenges that we faced. Uh, Albin is going to discuss that um, and the future work that could be done in this uh, regard. So I'll start off the first half of my presentation, and Albin takes it uh, eventually. So to give you a little bit background about tracing, how many of you have used tracing or any kind of performance analysis uh, frameworks in real life? OK, a lot of people. That, that's super awesome. So uh, you may be using it in different kind of ways. Uh, one of the most uh, common ways to use tracing is throughout your stack, actually. Uh, I've tried to differentiate this using uh, this small diagram, um, where you must have been hearing about open tracing, Jaeger, all, all these new frameworks. These all fall under the distributed tracing category. Uh, this is all actually a gradient, I would say. It's not like distinct categorization. It's mostly a gradient. But you can see some differences there. For, for example, like in distributed tracing, uh, you would get information about uh, what's flowing from one service to another microservice to another microservice. You may get information about individual functions that are inside each of the microservice and how they are communicating, which falls into the category of application tracing. Uh, the moment you go a little bit more down, you can even know about uh, what was happening inside the application from the infra infrastructure level. So this is where uh, you can see what was happening inside the OS when a uh, given uh, function was being executed in user space. So this is kind of uh, what tracing is. It's very different from other uh, ways of performance analysis in the sense it gives you exactly true flow of an application, uh, and that's why we actually call it tracing. Um, it, it's because it's uh, running on very high of uh, high frequency uh, events that are generated, such as syscalls, interrupts, and scheduling events, which are there in from the operating systems. So we need it to be super high performant as well. Uh, the basis of tracing is instrumentation. I, I'll explain it a little bit later. And it's used for performance analysis as well as security. So based on the same base of instrumenting a specific function, you can either use it for performance analysis or you can use it for security. So a very fine example which I keep on giving to people what tracing is. Think of your program as this bike which is running. And you put some paint, you spray some paint on, your, uh, on the tires of the bike, which is what you're instrumenting your application. 
and uh, these individual points where you had just sprayed, it's, it's basically your trace point. So as you start running your bike, you are generating events, and you get an actual trace uh, on the road. So uh, based on that, you can find out where it was recorded. For example, these traces will give you exact time at what event happened. So you can, you can think of it like visually like that. So uh, tracing can be static or dynamic. Static tracing is uh, a lot of static tracing infrastructure is already there in the kernel. Or if you are writing your own user space applications, you can instrument them yourself. Uh, for example, kernel trace points with perf, ftrace, eBPF, they all support uh, static tracing now. If you're writing your own applications, you can have compile time instrumentation embedded. Uh, I don't know how many of you have used uh, some certain flags in GCC, like SIG profile or PG profile guide instrumentation. You, you may be able to use that. There are other uh, applications like LTTNG, which provide this, and USDT. So by default, you have a lot of trace points already there in uh, JVM, in the Python's interpreter, as well as the Ruby's interpreter. Dynamic tracing is... Uh, more awesome than static tracing, I would say, because your application keeps on running. You can just dynamically insert any point there and start probing what's coming out uh, from your application. By application, I also mean the kernel. So kernel also provides uh, dynamic tracing infrastructure in the form of uh, k-probes, k-rate probes. If you're in user space, you can write your own infrastructure by using dynamic instrumentation tools, such as uh, pin tools and denist. Um, U probes are also there. You can dynamically instrument with the help of the kernel and user space application, and then get information out of each uh, function's execution. Uh, on they, they used to be dtrace. I think there still is dtrace on BSD and Mac, but I have uh, not used it very thoroughly. Uh, this closely resembles what eBPF provides in tracing these days. So to move very quickly, so code instrumentation. You want to know about this function? You insert some call, which is call me maybe. When the function gets executed, the call me maybe gets executed. You collect some data. You fill your data with, the, with whatever you want. It can be timestamps if you are looking for performance. And if you don't take timestamps, you can only look for individual events. It comes into the domain of auditing and security. Um, so in kernel, as an example of this, in kernel, uh, the k-probes based instrumentation is provided using this. Uh, where you actually have a kernel function, which is patched. The first instruction gets patched, and it goes on to another uh, handler. Uh, which it, it goes on to another area, which is actually called as a trampoline. And where you can save your registers, you call the pre-handler, which basically collects whatever can run at the pre-handler. There are multiple collectors that can run there. One of them is eBPF. That's what we are using in our whole infrastructure. And then you can restore the registers. The original instruction which got displaced gets executed, and you jump back for your normal execution. The actual thing is more complex than that, but to simplify, I have uh, explained it like this. So what is eBPF? Uh, yesterday, we got a very good definition. I give you one more definition from my perspective. Uh, it's a stateful programmable in kernel decisions for networking, tracing, and security. Uh, that's how the user space folks understand BPF. Uh, maybe the kernel has different opinions about this, but I want this. Uh, I want the. Uh, I want this interface from the kernel to the user space to be as seamless uh, that it becomes the one ring to rule them all uh, for networking, tracing, as well as security. So, uh, just a small intro. I, I, I'll go through it very quickly because we have seen it in previous talks about this. Uh, the classical BPF used to be there from 1993 onwards. Uh, it was used for network packet filtering. Sometime later, uh, seccomp-based uh, BPF programs were also added so that you could actually do trace call, uh, uh, syscall filtering there. Uh, it was a small in-kernel VM, very, very small and very uh, easy to use bytecode. And then it was extended eventually as eBPF with more registers, a more complex and a better verifier. You could attach uh, on trace points, K probes, U probes, USDT, like whatnot. I'm, I'm more interested in tracing, so I'm just focusing again and again on that. Uh, you can also use it for like um, uh, network packet filtering or, or much more other uh, use cases that have already been discussed. Uh, there's a new syscall, uh, so you can control uh, it via BPF syscall. There is trace collections with BPF maps or using directly uh, taking the data to the trace pipe, which exists in the uh, kernel already. Um, I mean, this facility is already provided. 
Uh, it's, it's been upstream in 3.18. There is bytecode compilation, which is also upstream in LLVM. So if you're using Clang LLVM, you by default have a machine, uh, a target where the BPF bytecode can be generated. So a program looks something like this. There's a BPF program. You compile it with LLVM Clang, and then you can directly insert it using the BPF syscall inside the kernel. It gets verified, and then native code gets generated for the architecture on which you're running it. Uh, you can design the program in such a manner that it can hook onto kernel functions. The data can be shared between user space and kernel using BPF maps. With K-probes, it's exactly the same thing, uh, but it's attached to, exact, uh, it's attached to a K-probe, and uh, you can use BPF maps to read and update uh, uh, and share the data between what you collect uh, and how you collect it. And uh, the events that come out from uh, each of the program's execution, uh, they can be either given to the trace a pipe or a perf buffer, and then you can build your infrastructure over this. So we use this as the base for uh, trace left. Uh, a more easy example of how a BPF program looks is it's in restricted C syntax. This is actually how it looks in the back. Uh, so every time you, you will have your kernel function being a hit, uh, the, this program is going to get executed. So some of the things it has is that you can see some helper functions here, like BPF get SMP processor ID, it gives you on which CPU it's running right now, uh, the current PID of the current process, you can get these things. Uh, and then from here, because you have the context, which is actually uh, all the registered uh, registers, all the register values when the kernel program was uh, hit. So you have all those registers ready. So these are simple helpers to get uh, the arguments from that if you are following like the calling conventions on whatever architecture it is. So um, you get these values. You can then build your own event. An event is stored like this. It's an event structure, and then you can output it to a perf buffer. Uh, so the definition of events look like this. These are maps. This is the way you can share data between the user space and uh, the kernel. And for example, this is the structure for this specific event, which is also stored in maps. And then you can uh, output them. So which brings us to Traceleft. It's open source. You can go here, and you can look at what Traceleft is, how it's uh, designed. It's a framework to build syscall network and file auditing monitoring tools. It's a work in progress. I should tell this to you beforehand. There are a lot, there's a lot of stuff that can be done here, and uh, you're welcome to contribute. Uh, it's CBPF and KPro based, and it has been tested to work on kernel 4.4 plus till 4.16. Uh, 4.18 is not working right now. I tried it, so, but we have some patches uh, we are working on. Probably tomorrow they'll be fixed. So uh, also, it has a binary called traceleft, which is a reference implementation of the framework itself. Uh, the main goal here is that there is a single binary, which is there, and a battery of uh, what you want to trace. For example, what syscalls you want to trace, what events you want to trace. You just have a single binary and this whole battery, and you put it onto any system for which that single binary and that battery has been provided, and it's going to generate events. There is no need for... Uh, BCC to be there, there is no need for any uh, library to be there on the system on which you are running. So it's, it's like a pre-generated thing. It's a very targeted tracing thing, what I, I tried to call it then. This was our use case, which we used internally at ShiftLift, where we just build like for one different, uh, one specific uh, machine, we just build this battery, uh, what we want to trace, we build this binary and we just put it, and it starts generating events and we just save it. So everything is compiled based on a configuration you give for compiling the whole uh, small binary that you have, as well as for the uh, battery of events that you want to save. So uh, why? Because tracing that just works. I mean, obviously. Um, this is a high-level view of the architecture. You want to trace an application's flow of certain calls. There is a main BPF program that is there, which actually ha uh, puts K probes on all the functions that you want to monitor. Uh, for example, we have just syscalls here. Uh, and then the data is sent to the program maps. It's a, I'll go in the details of each of these sections later. Trace left, trace left controls all of them. And uh, then there are specific event handlers for each of them. So there is just one program that is already there, which actually calls individual uh, eBPF programs for each of the event that uh, we want. 
Uh, this is what it looks like a little bit more deep. So there's a specific map, there are K probes and K red probes. And uh, based on each individual event that is there, uh, the specific event handler eBPF program is called via tail calls. So there, there's one base main eBPF program, and then it makes tail calls to individual uh, small, small eBPF programs, which each generate a single event for a single uh, probe that you have put, either on a syscall or, you, or on any other network event. And then it, and it puts all, all of them in an eBPF, uh, in, a, in a perf map, and trace left keeps on reading from that perf, uh, perf map. There are multiple components of this. Uh, it's not an ideal scenario uh, because you need you have a meta generator which generates uh, Go structures, which generates C structures because you are generating these events and they have to be stored somewhere. So it looks at the kernels, uh, syskernel debug tracing, even syscall for the syscall's battery of the probes. Uh, and then it generates those structures directly. And then we have a generator which generates the handler, individual handler programs, which are, which are on the right-hand side there. And then a battery, which is actually compiled version of all of that. And um, then there is an actual part. You, you can go uh, in, on, the, uh, 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 on the source code on GitHub, and in, you can see what each of these components are doing there as well. So then you have a probe which is responsible for registering, and then, the, then there is a tracer which actually uh, starts polling individual perf maps and giving you the data. And then uh, we have a reference implementation of an aggregator also, uh, which exposes an aggregator API, so you can uh, get all the events and aggregate them. A configuration looks something like this. So you want to trace an open event. It has all these arguments. Uh, for example, first position, second position, third position, which obviously looks like open. Uh, it's a per event configuration. What do you want to collect? What, what are the variables you want to collect at each each of the sections? You can do it. It's it's just done once. You know, once you have to just do it and update it very rarely for each of the event inside the kernel. You don't have to keep on updating it. Um, and then there is this aggregator, so you can you have channels. You can save the data to a log. You can send it to gRPC. You have uh, events like open, for example, we had open, and then you can set rules. This is like still like not completely okay. And then uh, you have how you want to aggregate it. So what functions you want to apply when you are aggregating it. So these are two configurations that you provide. And based on that, the events are generated. This is the whole build process which goes on. It, it, so, uh, so as I told you that this is like the first meta generator state, which generates each individual structures, then uh, source for uh, each individual handlers, and then BPF programs after compiling using Clang. Maybe we can update it later by not using Clang and just directly using the LLVM API. Um, and then. It generates your own binary, which is your own implementation. Uh, a CLI, for example, looks uh, something like this. Uh, uh, the, this is the reference implementation, which actually just tries to trace everything based on the battery. I think Alvin can explain you a little bit more about this. Hello, so I will do a demo. <laughs> Let's see if it works. I prepared two uh, very short demo. Um, and since I don't remember what everything I'm doing, I took some notes. Uh, I have two shells, one on the right with the PID, and I will start the trace left um, binary, and I will tell it to trace, and I will load uh, some specific um, BPF handler and to apply this only on this specific PID. So the handler I call for the, are for the read and write system call. So let's see what happens when I run that. And that uh, should trace the terminal on the right. So if I try to type something, I can see all the read and write system calls. Um, that's the first uh, demo. And while doing that, I only trace uh, this specific uh, PID, so I can uh, specify on the command line here um, to not to trace the f all the uh, system calls from the whole system, but only for this one. Um, let me start the second demo. So for this demo, I uh, prepared a script. It's a very simple script that uh, starts a TCP connection. 
So uh, after a couple of seconds, he start a TCP server and a TCP client and connect uh, to each other. And uh, I will ask Trustleft to um, trace the um, busy box script shell. Uh, so let me start the script. And then I start the tracer. After a few seconds, I should see uh, the connect TCP connect event and with uh, uh, specific information attached to it, like uh, the connection tuple, TCP source, destination, etc. And if I stop this, I should uh, see the TCP close event. So as you can see here, I, I see uh, connect and close, but I don't see the uh, TCP accept event. That's because um, I only trace uh, one specific uh, process. That's the process um, of the shell script here. And I it didn't trace, trace the other one. Um, I have another demo with the help of Sushagra. Um, here I'm logged on, um, on a web server. Um, I, st I just started a uh, trace left. And instead of specifying read or write, I just uh, pass all the networking uh, battery BPF program that we have. So that does the same thing. And, uh, yeah, and I'm like, just with opening my own website. With me, and I just opened my own website, and we can see like from where it connects, and basically like trace the network calls which are going on on this server. So this is just a simple server which is running nginx and my own website. That's it. Yeah, so there was one uh, more uh, like elaborative demo that we did internally based on the trace left where we had like our own monitoring agent for syscalls and, uh, and this was using the aggregator API that is there provided by the trace left itself. And it looked something like this. I don't have this demo right now, but you can at least uh, appreciate that. You can make something as complex as a nice NCURSES UI for, for like uh, syscall monitoring. Uh, based on trace left. Okay. So I think Alban continues from here and he discusses something very important that we learned. So this is more important than trace left uh, because this shows uh, the challenges we faced and how we overcame some of them and what else can be done later on. Uh, yes. So m uh, a lot of the challenge we face is because we wanted to support uh, kernel 4.4 on some of the issues we face has been fixed uh, in later kernel versions, but I will explain a bit uh, the context of that. Uh, so the first challenge uh, that I will explain is uh, matching PIDs on applications. So the goal of uh, TraceLeft is to have uh, some kind of uh, tracing profile for a specific application. And one application can be uh, one or several process. Um, sometimes it can be very short-lived process. If it is shell scripts, it starts and stops a lot of process. Um, uh, an application can be maybe a systemd unit uh, running inside a C group started by systemd, or it could be a container. In that case, it might live in different Linux namespace and uh, different C groups. So uh, when we wanted to implement that, we uh, looked at the different BPF helper function to see what exists there. I just uh, mentioned a few of them. Uh, I just look at the, uh, the ones which mention PID or uh, C group or namespace. Uh, there is the first one, which get the current uh, PID and uh, process ID, uh, task ID, which exists in uh, kernel since kernel 4.2. So that's uh, perfect because we, uh, our uh, restriction was it has to work on the kernel 4.4. There are some others um, get C group class ID, which are not related to tracing. So. Um, on some other, uh, which I put in red, because that, was, uh, that didn't fit our criteria that it has to work on kernel 4.4. Um, this list comes from this uh, GitHub web page that's very useful to, as a documentation to list all the BPF helper function and see what, can, what things you can do there. Um, so since here, um, basically on kernel 4.4, the only thing I could use was um, to uh, check from the BPF program what kind of, uh, what is the PID of the process being traced at the moment. So uh, as a consequence, the API or trace left is based uh, on that. It looks, uh, there is actually um, a function as part of the API where you have to give uh, which PID you want to trace, and then uh, the BPF program is going to look at that. Uh, 
Of course, um, we want uh, when we build the whole fra framework using a trust left, we want to um, match the application and not only one single PID. So we need to use something else uh, in addition to that. And um, at the time, we uh, implemented that using a Linux facility called the PROC connector. Um, so the PROC connector is um, um, a subfamily on the Netflix socket family. How many of you know what is Netflix? Uh, sorry, Netlink. <laughs> 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 About everybody, cool. <laughs> so um, using Netlink, on the connector, you can uh, receive, um, it's a publish subscribe mechanism when you can receive some events. And in this case, we can get information, uh, a notification whenever there is a fork, exec, or exec on the new process. Uh, so we can know whenever there is a new process, and maybe that's one process that belongs to the application we want to trace. That's something that is uh, quite old, so it works fine on uh, Linux 4.4. Um, this proc connector is, uh, has quite some strong limitations, so it's not really perfect, but uh, it works okay. Um, it only works on, um, it doesn't really work in a container. There are, um, it has to work in an initial user namespace, uh, in an initial PID namespace, etc. And it re requires network privilege, which is a bit uh, weird when we are tracing uh, processes. Um, and although it doesn't give all the information we need, it doesn't give uh, cgroups information or namespace. So it means whenever we use this, we have to, in addition to that, uh, read in slash proc uh, to get the additional information we wanted. But then reading from two different source information, it brings some uh, rest condition, which are uh, a bit difficult to solve and sometimes not directly solvable. Um, some, uh, for example, uh, short-lived process, which are quite happen uh, often on sh shell scripts. They cannot, um, the trace process might not have the time to read in slash proc the information we need. Um, so um, I would recommend not to use the proc connector for that, but that's what uh, that come from the limitation we had that it has to work on kernel 4.4. Uh, now there is new BPF helper function that um, does that are more suitable. Uh, for example, uh, get we can get the C group uh, where we are running, uh, which um, this one exists since uh, kernel 4.18. And in general, I would recommend to use a new facility, or if they don't exist, uh, try to improve the kernel. Another difficulty we had was uh, related to strings in the BPF. So I take this example. So let's say in um, user space application in your program, there is this open system call where you pass, pass as a parameter the file name. And then since we added uh, kprobe with the BPF uh, on the open system call, we will uh, at some point have this uh, BPF helper function that will be executed that will read the file name. Uh, so it will copy the buffer, uh, the string buffer. And then when the syscall is actually executed, in order to implement the uh, open system call, the kernel will copy again the same uh, buffer for the file name. So there are two copies here. Uh, that brings some mm, things which are uh, not perfectly fine. That's a time of check, time of use issue. Um, so if the program is multi-threaded and uh, change the value of the buffer in user space, we might not uh, see what's really uh, going on there. There are other issues with uh, strings. So before, uh, since we are running on kernel 4.4, we didn't have this nice um, helper function which can uh, copy strings. So what we did instead was um, arbitrarily copy 256 bytes, which uh, quite often is enough for a file name, but sometimes is not. And we had another issues like, uh, let's say this is here your um, virtual memory of one process. You have some regions which are mapped in memory and some uh, address which doesn't map to any uh, physical memory. And if you give a um, pointer to uh, quite close to the border of the map region, maybe you will not be able to read uh, 256 bytes because we will go outside of, the, of that region. And that could cause um, uh, a fault, uh, which is fine in BPF because all the BPF helper functions that you use are correctly designed not to crash your kernel, but still that um, um, cause some surprise when developing this. 
Um, another challenge, which is um, not really solved uh, properly here, it's um, about identifying files. So since we uh, did, um, when we read or write uh, on the file system, we use the read and write system calls, and we pass the file descriptors. But it's uh, not so easy to uh, track what file descriptor uh, match which uh, file name. So uh, to do that properly, we will need to uh, track uh, this file descriptor belong to this um, uh, fi file and so on. But uh, here in this example, if you use a DUP system call, then that, that makes it a bit more complicated. And actually, processes can get file descriptors from different sources. There is, of course, uh, open or open at system calls um, on this DUP, uh, all these DUP system calls. But you can have a lot more places where you can get a new file descriptors. And uh, for example, uh, you can receive one from Unix sockets, and that's not easily traceable. And another way is when, uh, even for the open system call, where we are given a, a string uh, for the file name, it's not so easy to map that string to the actual f file uh, with the mount number and the inon number and so on. Uh, that's because th this path is going to be looked up, um, taking into account the mount namespace you are in, the CH root, the root directory you use, or if it is a relative path, the current uh, working directory, and so on. And in the middle, you can have a lot of symlinks, which make things complicated. So we don't have uh, proper implementation. That at the moment, we have something which works in some case, but not everything. Um, all of this difficulty comes from the fact we put the uh, kprob on the open system call. And that's uh, maybe too high level, where we only get the file name. Um, there is other uh, projects, like uh, Landlog uh, uh, Linux Security Module, which try to do that on a lower level in the kernel, where they, they use uh, Linux security hooks, uh, where they actually have access to the proper kernel objects they want to track, like uh, inodes, mounts, etc. So that uh, will be something uh, to explore, to do something similar. Um, Tracking networking was uh, a bit difficult as well. So when we have a connect system call, we can see uh, in the system call the IP, destination IP. Um, but we don't have the full um, connection tuples there. Um, so what we did is we added a few more k-probs uh, on a specific function in the kernel to add uh, to get the information we need. And that's, uh, the source is really similar to uh, that come from another project from uh, WeaveScope, where we did similar work. And another thing, uh, difficult part, uh, sometimes we lost uh, events. So um, I will uh, explain two different uh, reasons why we can lost events. So uh, BPF programs run um, Synchronously, I will say, a BPF program cannot sleep, cannot wait. Uh, and when it emits uh, events to, some to user space, we use a path ring buffer. So a ring buffer can be overwritten if it is full. Then we just write over and we don't uh, wait, we don't sleep. Uh, so we chose a specific size for the ring buffer. And uh, if it is too small, it's possible that uh, we just lose some events. And another reason where we can lo lose events uh, is with k -red props. So Sushakra explained before how k props work, where we put a jump instruction at the beginning of the function, and we go to uh, another routine. Uh, k -red prob is a bit similar, but a bit different too. So we um, does come from the fact that we don't know where the um, return uh, instruction will be. That depends where it's called from. Uh, so we, in, uh, what caret prop does is to um, save the function where it comes from before the function call and uh, uh, save that. But a function can be called uh, several times in parallel. If you have multiple CPU, if you have preemptible kernels, um, then uh, it means you need to save several positions and there is, you don't have infinite memory, so we, um, by default, um, Carrot prob is only able to save so many um, concurrent calls. And in BPF, there was a default value which comes from this. Uh, it turns about it uh, takes this formula. And with the example of 
access system calls, that's where we had the most problem, because the accept system call can take a long time. If you don't have any incom incoming connections, it can sleep for hours. And if you have several process uh, running the accept system call, then we will have uh, several uh, carried props <laughs> going on in parallel. Um, so we added, uh, we work with uh, others on the kernel to add, um, make it configurable, but still that doesn't solve uh, completely this issue. Okay. And uh, lastly, um, what we sh um, could do in the future, uh, maybe use trace point uh, since um, it was not really an option uh, on kernel 4.4, uh, but um, that will off uh, offer a, uh, maybe um, more stable API than using kprops. We can change uh, at any point during kernel versions. And we have a new uh, BPFL function that will uh, help to do things more properly as well. And we could use um, the LLVM API directly instead of uh, forking shell uh, to, to start this. So I will uh, leave back yeah, to Sushara. Just some references here. Um, we have some projects that have already been done. If you have seen BCC already, you know this. Uh, there was BPFD, which is uh, very recent, which looks something like what we have in Tracelift. Uh, but in the addition that it also has a daemon and you can do much more actions with it. There was an older BPFD, uh, which was also there, um, which also looks something like us. And then uh, BPF Trace, which is very promising. Uh, it's by Alastair, I think, and, and the same with Ply. So they both look, uh, BPF Trace and Ply, they are like languages uh, which look like Dtrace. Uh, and they directly generate BPF code and they can be executed. Uh, then Landlock LSM, which is an LSM, it is promising, it's probably upcoming in the kernel. And then uh, Oddity, which clearly resembles uh, what we are trying to do with syscall monitoring here, uh, when audit system is already there inside the kernel with K Oddity uh, as a um, uh, separate module, so you can leverage that as well. Some docs and tutorials about BPF, you can look at them later uh, if you want to read something about this. And there has been research work done, obviously, on this, and you can also read about this later. So that's all. Uh, you can ask us some questions. I would specifically like to thank um, Kinvolk uh, for working with us on this, and Iago, and uh, Mikael, and everybody else. Uh, thank you. Uh, if you have questions, you can just ask. Check. Thanks. Uh, do you have some numbers on the overhead of, of uh, Trace Left? Uh, some rough idea? Yes, actually, Traceleft has, uh, thanks to, I think you did that, there is a, a pprof uh, endpoint in Traceleft itself. You can actually profile Traceleft as it's running, so you can uh, uh, check what's the overhead. Uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I have them somewhere, and they are somewhere, I think, in the repo itself. I will check it. Uh, in the repo, there is a documentation directory and in the documentation directory, there is a section called as performance and profiling, uh, which, which tells you how to use it. Yeah, I would say there are two possible sources where overhead can come from, from the BPF programs, but I think it's quite low. And, uh, I don't have numbers, but other projects make numbers of that. On the trace left uh, binary running in user space, I think that's where most of the overhead will take place, and that's where the BPF will help. Thanks.